Hello, apes. This is question number two of the um, free response from the first practice exam. Question number two reads, uh, the waste generated by humans is both an environmental and human health concern. Um, going through the part A, part A1 asks you to describe a main goal of primary treatment in modern sewage treatment plants. So you have to understand that uh, treatment plants are broken up into primary, secondary, and often tertiary treatment. This question is just asking about the primary treatment and the main goal of the primary treatment. If we look right up here, uh, the main goal of primary treatment is to separate solid waste from waste water. And so it's just talking, as long as you're talking about separating out the sludge or the solid waste from the wastewater. That is the primary treatment. Number two asks to describe the main goal of the secondary treatment in modern sewage treatment plants. Um, the main goal of secondary treatment is to break down organic matter using microbes. You can elaborate if you want as far as on the microbes, but I don't believe that you would need to as long as you talk about using microbes to break down organic matter. Number three then asks many sewage treatment plants use a tertiary treatment as a final step in wastewater treatment. Describe one advantage of this process. Well, tertiary treatment is typically where you go in and you kill the microbes or any pathogens or you remove any um, additional limiting nutrients such as phosphorus or nitrogen. So when that water is released, that it doesn't accidentally cause any algal blooms. And so two correct answers. Realize this is only asking for one advantage, so only give them one advantage and give them the one you feel most confident in. Um, so you could say tertiary treatment of wastewater kills most microbes or pathogens, decreasing the spread of disease. Or you could also say tertiary treatment of wastewater removes limiting nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen to reduce the potential of algal blooms. So you're telling um, what it is and what it does. Four, if a sewage treatment plant malfunctions or if low income areas lack sanitary waste disposal, raw sewage can be introduced into surface waterways. Describe one potential environmental problem or not end, or one potential human health problem that can result from the presence of raw sewage in surface water. In this case, um, I gave you two different answers. Um, first, you could talk about going with, you know, the fact that if you don't remove those nutrients, eutrophication, eutrophication could happen. So eutrophication from excess nutrients and sewage overflow decreases dissolved oxygen in water, which can lead to aquatic organism death. Um, or you could talk about the health concerns, so disease-causing pathogens can be introduced into surface water, which is consumed as drinking water, and therefore spread infectious disease. And so both of those would be ideal answers, not both together, but one or the other. <clears throat> um, five is just asking you to identify one water parameter that could be measured. There's actually... Uh, a number of different water um, parameters that actually could be measured. In this case, um, I think probably the easiest one for us, since it's kind of been something talked about, would be dissolved oxygen. Because if you're looking at dissolved oxygen and you see that's decreasing, you would know that there is a problem. Uh, turbidity, also the ability to um, how, much, how much particulate is there. And then a fecal coliform test. Uh, those of us around here who maybe like to go out to McBride or Kent Park in the summer, we know what that test is because they, um, it has been frequently a case where you were asked to not swim in those waters because of high fecal coliform. Um, going on to question B, it's looking at some statistics of um, municipal solid waste. It's looking at the total amount of municipal solid waste generated and then the total amount of municipal solid waste in landfills. Um, and you notice that the total municipal solid waste generated increases from 1960 all the way up 
really through 2015, whereas the landfill waste significantly levels off around oh the 1990s for sure, almost declining a little bit. And so B question one or I asks, describe the trend of the total municipal solid waste generated from 1960 to 1915. Um, literally, you just have to say that it increased. <clears throat> um, if you wanted to say it increased and then leveled off, you can, but it really, looking at it collectively, the total municipal solid waste generated increased. Number two, compare the trends in the total municipal solid waste generated and the total municipal solid waste landfill between 1990 and 2000. And so we're going to go to that 1990 to 2000 range right here. Um, and you're gonna see that the total municipal solid waste generated increased while the municipal solid waste landfill remained constant, uh, maybe even with a slight decrease. Question three then asks to explain a probable reason for the trend in the total municipal solid waste landfill described in B. <clears throat> um, and this could actually, you could answer this a number of different ways. The reality is that laws and le legislation, conservative me measures in the 1990s or following the 1990s that, were, that took place actually helped this. And so you would obviously want to start out because you're explaining. So an increase in municipal solid waste being recycled resulted in a decrease of it ending up in landfills. An increase in municipal solid waste being composted ended up in a decrease in municipal solid waste in landfills. Or um, it would have been after the 90s where we saw more municipal solid waste being burned to produce electricity um, being implemented after the 1990s reduced the municipal solid waste in the landfill. And so looking at any of those type of conservation, recycle, reuse, re renew um, measures that were taken following the 1990s would be a probable reason. Moving on to C, uh, one environmental problem in landfills is that organic materials such as food scraps and yard waste can decompose and produce methane over time. Methane is flammable and can be very dangerous in large concentrations. It has a very high... Um, uh, greenhouse gas factor. And so if you're looking at one, propose a solution to reduce the risk of flammable methane from concentrating in landfills. The one method that I know we've talked about in different cases, even when we talked about mining, is that a solution to reduce the risk of flammable methane um, from landfills or from anything is to flare or burn the methane from venting and then releasing the byproducts into the air. Byproducts are still greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is going to be a less potent greenhouse gas than methane. Um, another thing you could do is you actually, a solution could be to collect the methane and use it as a fuel source to generate electricity or turn a turbine or something of those sorts. Um, and then going on to two, it's just asking you to justify your solution that you propose. So it's kind of continuation. <coughs> And so if we went with the two uh, solutions that I shared, um, if we go with A, so if we're going to flare and burn, burning methane reduces um, methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas, into a less potent carbon dioxide greenhouse gas. So that would be your justification as to why you would do that. Or if you're going to collect it to use as a fuel source, collecting methane as a fuel source provides an economic benefit to the consumer and decreases reliance on coal being extracted. So both of those, you're just justifying why the thing you proposed actually does make sense. Okay, that wraps up question number two. There's uh, 10 points in there. And the next video, I will go over the last question, question three, which incorporates some math.